Seches Gitin Daf Mem Aleph. We begin with the Mishnah at the bottom of Daf Mem, and we'll have another Mishnah about halfway through. So the first Mishnah sounds a bit difficult to interpret. The Gemara explains the entire Mishnah step by step according to a number of different understandings, completely different opinions as to how to explain the Mishnah. So let's see the Mishnah, and then we'll get into the Gemara's explanations. So the Mishnah's words are as follows. An Eved, whose master made him into an Apoitiki. Apoitiki means he was set aside as the specific source of repayment of an obligation. That means that the master owed money. Let's say Ruvain owned the Eved. He owed money to Shimon. And Ruvain said that the collection is going to be from the Eved. Then the then it says, and he was freed. We're not going to be clear who was freed. Who freed? Well, the Eved was freed, but who freed him? So he was freed. So the Mishnah says as follows. The letter of the law is that the Eved doesn't owe anything. Not clear who he doesn't owe to. And then it says, but because of Tikkun Eilam, in order to fix the world, we force his master, and we don't know which master, Reuben or Shimon, and sets him free. And there's written a contract on his money. And again, we don't know who writes the contract on the money. And then he becomes free. Now, that's the Tadakama. Or Shimon ben... Gamliel says he doesn't write, he frees. And again, we don't know who writes and who sets free. So we're going to have to work through this Mishnah carefully and answer all these questions and see how it makes sense. But in short, what the Mishnah says is that if you have an Eved who was set aside to repay a loan and then he's freed, so he goes free, he doesn't owe anything, Some, but um, he has to... He's free, but somebody has to write a Shtar Shukhar and has to be repaid. And if Shemagam Gamliel argues and he says, you don't write, you're free. All right, so what does this mean? So the Gemara's first part is Rav. And he says, who freed him? His original master, the one who owed the money, freed him. So the letter of the law is that the loan, the obligation to pay, is canceled completely. And this is an opinion of uh, Rava, which we've seen elsewhere, that if somebody is... If something is in a paitiki, if, if a certain property is set aside, that the entire lien is only on that, and then one of three things happens to that. Either it becomes hectish, so if it's an animal that's kosher for a carbon, it becomes kedushas haguf, or if it's chomet and it becomes pesach, so it becomes chomet sha'avar all of hapesach, or it's an event and it's freed. Any of these things, the entire value is lost. If it becomes, if it's an animal and it becomes a carbon, it knocks off any other use you could do with it. If it's chametz, it becomes aser and it knocks off anything you could do with that. If it's an evid, he goes free, he doesn't belong to anybody, he's nobody's monetary possession, so it knocks off that. So therefore, when the original master set him aside as an apaitiki, but then he freed him, so the loan is not collectible any longer, the evid, the value of the evid no longer belongs to the original owner. Now, so that's the letter of the law. Now, what does it say, Mipnei Tikkun O'elam? So we're afraid that the second owner, the would-be owner, the one who was supposed to collect the loan from him, is going to find him in the street and start accusing him of being his evidence. He's going to say, you were supposed to be re- the repayment of my loan, you're my evidence. And then people are going to start to talk, and people will think he's an evidence, and they'll end up assuming that his child, are of Adam, and there'll be multi laws on the children of the seven. We don't want that to happen. Therefore... We make, we force this second master, the one who claims, we force him to write a shtar shikhar. And though he has no claim, he can't accuse anybody of anything. Now, however, since we force him to write a shtar he deserves to get paid, and he gets his money. How does he get the money? So that's the machagus between the Tanakhama and Rosh Hashem in the Mishnah. The Tanakhama says the Evid has to pay him, because the Evid is the one who has the value that he had wanted, and the Evid is the one who wants to go free. Rosh Ben Gamliel says, the Eved doesn't write Meshachar, the Meshachar, the one who freed him, that is the original owner, he's the one who writes it. Why? Because he's the one who destroyed the Shebut. The second owner had a lien on the Eved, and he got rid of the Eved. He's the one who destroyed the Shebut. What's the argument over? If somebody destroys someone else's lien, does he have to pay for it or not? Um, and that's Machagas, we know Shem Gamliel, and that Chacham, according to Shem Ben Gamliel, you destroy the lien, you have to pay for it. According to Chacham, the lien is not value, and you don't have to pay for that. And we see this elsewhere as well. We see a machalikas also where it says if somebody destroys someone else's lien, this is a machalikas between Rosh and Ben Gamliel and the Chachamim, whether or not he needs to pay for it or not. Now we get to the second shot in this Mishnah, and this is Ula. Ula says, who freed him? 
the second owner freed him before he ever received him as payment of the monetary obligation, he set him free. Now, this is weird because he didn't own him. So, that, so the fact that he set him free doesn't change anything. So we say, Ein ha'evid chayef klum, he doesn't owe anything, we mean he's not chayef in any mitzvahs more than he was before because there's no validity to being freed by somebody who doesn't own him. However, people in the street talk and they say that he was set free because they view the second owner as his owner already since they knew that he was owed to that second owner. And therefore, people are starting to say that he's a free man, they're going to expect him to keep mitzvahs like a free man, and therefore we want him to actually act like a free man. So therefore we force the original owner to actually go ahead and set him free. Now the original owner may be losing something. Even though he had to lose the Eved to the second owner to pay the loan, it could be that the Eved was worth more than the value of the loan. Let's say the Eved was worth $1,000 and the loan was only $900. So he lost $100 by the fact that he lost his Eved, $100 more than the $900 that he had to pay. So therefore, he has to be reimbursed for that $100 that he lost. And here's the Machogas Tanakama and Rav Shimon Ben Kramlil, who reimburses that money? According to the Tana or Kakama, the Evid reimburses it because he's the one who walked off with his value. According to Shimon Ben Kramlil, the Meshachar, that is the second owner, he is the one who has to reimburse that because the Evid didn't do anything. He didn't set himself free. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't participate in this at all. And therefore, he doesn't have to pay for that. It's the second owner who has to pay that extra money to the original owner. It's Shimon has to pay that to Reuven in our example. Now, what is this argument about? So the Gemara says this argument is based on the question of Hezek She'eni Necker. That's if you destroy something, but there's no visible change. You've taken away its value, but you haven't vis- there, there, there is no destruction evident externally. So the Eved no longer is usable. But you didn't actually do anything to the Eved. He looks the same as he did before. So it's Hezek, which is not visible. So is that called a Hezek or not? That's Machlokes, which we have in Masechus Boba Basra. And that is what this Machlokes is about here as well. Rav Shimon Ben Gamliel says there is a Hezek that was caused by the second individual, so he has to pay for it. And the Tanakam holds there is no Hezek that is visible, and therefore it's not a Hezek, and therefore the second owner doesn't have to pay for anything. So this is more, why did they each not want to say like the other opinion? Why did Rav and Ula not want to say like the other opinion? And... The one says it boils down to linguistics. The Mishnah refers to the second owner either as rabbi, as master, or as mashachar, or as the freer. So the Gemara says, Ula takes issue with calling him rabbi. How could rabbi, when you say that the rabbi, you forced the rabbi to free him, how could you call the second owner rabbi? He never owned him. And therefore, he says a different shot. He says that forcing the one to free has got to be referring to the first owner. That's the one who's really the rabbi. Rab says, what do you mean? But according to you, you're calling him the mashachar. How could you call him the Meshachar? He didn't free him. He never owned him in order to free him. So the word Meshachar doesn't make sense. Meshachar therefore has to refer to the first owner. He has to be the one who freed him. The one now speaks briefly about the subject of an apotiki in general, where somebody sets aside a specific property, a specific piece of real estate to be used to pay an obligation, to pay a loan. And the one is going to want to know if that piece of land gets destroyed, can the creditor collect from somewhere else? So the Gemara is going to divide it into how the Apartheid was set up. There's two ways to set it up. He could have said, you can only collect from this. If that's what he said, then he pretty much made this property already the possession of the one that he owes the money to. As he said, you're not going to get from anything else. This is the only thing. So he already put it by him. If that's true, it's much more likely to be that if it gets destroyed, it can't collect from somewhere else because his own property was already destroyed. If, however, he said, look, if I don't manage to pay you, you'll take from here, so that property is not yet belonging to the creditor. It's only if he doesn't pay. So if that's true, so then if it gets destroyed, he didn't lose his property. The one who owes the money lost, and he has to pay from somewhere else. That would be the most logical thing. But those are the two different phraseologies. Let's see what the Gemara says. The Gemara says, So the Gemara says, somebody who sets aside a certain field as an apoitiki, that it's specified to pay an obligation to someone else, and then it gets flooded by a river, and now the Gemara means it's going to stay flooded. The proper, the land is useless now. It's under water forever. So the Gemara is what the Allah is. The first opinion is someone named Ami Shapir No. Um... Shapir Na means, um, his name was Ami, and he was called Shapir Na, meaning good and beautiful. So he's his name, Rav he cannot collect from any other property. The, the, the creditor lost his money. Now, Shmuel's father says he can collect from other property. So as Menachem Bar Yitzchak, just because his name is Ami Shapir Na, means he could say things that don't make sense. He must be referring to where he said, you can only collect from here. And that's why he lost it. But if he said to the general that this is going to be, your lien will be on this property, there's no reason why he should 
lose. He should have. He should still owe him from other things. He didn't lose his property. It wasn't his yet. So Zimar, we have a bracelet that pretty much spells this out clearly. It says that somebody who makes a certain piece of land and a paitaki for someone else gets flooded by the river, so he can collect from any other property that the person has. If, however, he said, you can't collect from anything besides for this, then he cannot collect from anywhere else. Now we have another brysa. The brysa says if somebody makes a skill that a paitaki to a bacha, somebody owes money to, or to a ksuba, to pay off his wife's ksuba, and so, and something happens to it, she can, they can collect from somewhere else. And Shimon Megamil says it depends. The Balchayv, the one who borrowed, who lent him money, he can go collect from somewhere else. Uh, the woman cannot collect from anywhere else because she knew she was going to collect from here. And the reason that she was willing to accept this ksuba, the reason she was willing to marry him is because she did not want to have to go running around figuring out which field she she's owed and who bought it last and having to go to court with each individual. That That's not the way of womankind to go in to be involved in legal fights. And that's why she wanted this apology. And she never intended to collect from anywhere else. So if it gets lost, then she lost it. Now we get our next Mishnah. This Mishnah is another Tikkun Oilam. As we've been seeing Mishnah is one after another listing Tikkun Oilam have to do with Avadim. This one refers to someone who's half Evan and half Ben Chayron. So it says if someone is half an Evan, half Ben Chayron, Rashi explains he must have belonged to two partners. They each owned half, and one of them set him free. So now that half is free man, and the other half is Evan. So what should he do now? How does this work? So Basil's opinion, at first at least, is that he functions as a half Evan and as a half free man. He serves his master one day, and then he serves himself. One day he switches off, one day the other day. So that's how you split it. Meshame says that is very nice for the master who gets half of what he owns, or he gets at least half of the Evid. He gets full service to what he owns. However, you haven't solved things for the Evid because the Evid can't marry anybody. He cannot marry uh, Shifra because he's half Ben Charon, and he cannot marry Bas Charon because he's half Shifra. So maybe you'll say, okay, let him not marry anybody. That's not correct, because it's a mitzvah of Puravu. Bishamah says the world was only created for Puravu, like it says, He did not create it to be empty, he created it to be populated. So, as a Tikkun Island, we force the half-owner to set him free, and then he writes a star to pay for half of the value. That means to reimburse the master who sets him free for whatever he loses. Now, the, the mission concludes that Beis Hillel changed and Paskin like Bishamah as well. Now begin the Gemara. The Gemara introduces a machlekes tanaim on a slightly different related topic. And a machlekes amirayim, what is the case of the machlekes tanaim? So the machlekes tanaim is, can you free half an Evid? Now in our Mishnah, we talked about someone who is half Evid, but that's because he had two owners and one owner freed him completely. Our question is here is, let's say an Evid is owned by one person. Can he set half the Evid free? Does such a thing make sense? So the Bryce says it's a machlok is between Rebbe and the Chachamim. Rebbe says yes, Chachamim say no. Now, there's two possible situations here. What type of method of freedom are we talking about? Are we talking about where he gave him a shtar shikhar? Or are we talking about where the Evid redeemed himself by buying himself back, by giving money? Now, the machlok is Rabbah and Rebbe says which one is this machlekes. Now, which one's easier to say that it's half? So everybody agrees that money makes more sense to say that it's half freed, because you could just redeem yourself halfway. That a star should work halfway, that's much harder to hear. So says Rebbe, says Rabba, the machlekes is in the case of the star, but in case of the redemption, everybody agrees that it works. Says Rebbe Yosef, no, the machlekes is in the case of the redemption, and in the case of the star, everybody agrees that it does not work to do half. So let's analyze each one. So Rabbi says, Machlekes is by shtar. Um, where is that derived from? 